Hi everybody, um, my name is Stuart McDonald, I work at C-Media. Um, welcome to this, um, I'll be chairing things today, welcome to this Raven Housing Trust webinar on um, Journey to Net Zero Carbon. Now, we're just going to wait a couple of, a, a minute or so maybe for some more people to, to join, but while we're doing that, I'm just going to launch a quick poll, um, and just really to try and understand from those attendees uh, who are here just now, um, what stage you're at on your journeys to, to net zero carbon. So. I'm just going to do that now. You should see that on your on your screens. You just want to answer that, and as I say, we'll get going um, in just a minute or so once we've got a couple more attendees on. Hi, if you're just joining us now, I'm just uh, running a quick poll before we get going with the webinar proper, just uh, to understand what stage uh, people are at on their journey to net zero carbon. So if you could um, answer the quick poll, I can see half of you have voted in that now. So um, yeah, if we can get a few more responses, that'd be great. We'll get going just in about um, 30 seconds. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to close the poll now. Uh, thanks very much for those of you who voted. We've, we've had two thirds of you vote, which is great. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share the results so we can have a look at that. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment, but um, for the time being, um, hello and afternoon, everybody. We'll get going now. Um, welcome to this Raven Housing Trust webinar um, on the journey to net zero carbon. This uh, Today's session is going to focus on existing homes. Uh, my name is Stuart McDonald. I'm the Managing Director of C-Media. I'm going to be your event chair for today. Um, now, the um, the next uh, few minutes, we're going to obviously hear from some excellent speakers taking us through um, some of the, the key issues around um, retrofitting and existing properties. Um, really pleased to say that uh, we've got um, you know, an excellent panel to join us here today. Uh, we've got uh, Joe Hills, who is the uh, Director of Assets and Services at Raven Housing Trust. Uh, we have uh, Stuart uh, Gadson, who is the uh, Director of Sales at uh, for the Southeast at Kent's Contracting, and we've got Lydia McLaren, who's a research analyst at, at Savills. Um, now, before I hand over to, to Joe, just to make a few introductory uh, remarks from, from Raven, um, just a quick bit, couple of bits of housekeeping from me. Um, the uh, you should should see there's a, a question box uh, for uh, attendees on the right hand side of your screen. So please do use that to ask questions as we go. Um, really keen to get as many of you involved in the session as we can. Have a good debate. Um, each of the presentations will be about ten minutes long, uh, and then um, we'll have plenty of time hopefully at the end for for questions and discussions. So so do please get those questions coming in. I don't worry if you can't see all the questions. I can see them all. I'll make sure we get through as many as we can. Uh, when we finish up, um, the web webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be that recording and the slides are all going to be shared with all attendees. So uh, you, you'll receive all that. There'll also be a, a short survey at the end as well. Um, so it'd be great if you give us your feedback um, on that. OK, I think that's all I wanted to be saying just now. Um, the other thing to add, sorry, was just that, um, as I mentioned, there was a uh, previous um, webinar on uh, new build homes we did with Raven on, on Tuesday. Uh, so the recording of that is available on the Raven website, um, should you want to have a look at that. Uh, and uh, there's a third webinar as well we're doing next Thursday too, which is sort of tying everything together. But for now, um, I'm going to um, hand across to, to Joe just to say a couple of words of welcome from Raven. Joe. Hi. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jo Hills, I'm from Raven Housing Trust, I'm Director of Assets and Services, as Stuart said, um, and um, really pleased to be here today and thank you all for coming. Um, so 
I assume it was quite a surprise for a lot of people last year um, as uh, when the government suddenly announced um, that they were going to bring forward the um, net zero policy. Um, so yeah, in, in June last year, we became um, the first major economy in the world to pass laws to end our contribution to global warming. Um, obviously, that then set a huge challenge um, to the whole country, but, uh, but hugely to social housing as well, because um, obviously the existing homes um, in our country are one of the largest contributors <coughs> and um, and social housing because we are landlords of, of large numbers of properties are quite an easy way for the government to focus on um, achieving savings quite quickly so raven has taken this challenge very seriously um and we like to think that we're um, one of the first housing associations to have moved forward um, with the challenge, understanding the size of it um, and more importantly having sort of attributed a cost and, and starting to get a way of modelling that into our business plan. Um, we've uh, we've we started out by auditing our existing homes and we've determined our way ahead. I'm going to talk later about some of the key insights that Raven can share about that process um, and how we've categorised our stock um, to find out how to how to approach, approach each of the categories of homes. Um, it's likely that it'll have a big impact on customers. Um, so this is something else that we need to think about, and we'll talk about that later as well. Um, but we can see the benefits for customers in um, a more fuel efficient home in the long term um, from the point of view of affordability and comfort. Um, now that Raven's got a really good understanding of the size of the problem and we've planned our next steps, we're beginning to get into the detail of, of, of how we'll fund this and we'll be talking about that later as well. We've got some uh, really interesting guests, as um, Stuart said, and I'm, I'm really delighted that Raven's been able to um, host this. Um, it's a great treat for us um, to be able to explore this with some, uh, some of our partners and, um, and experts in the sector. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our speakers and I, I hope you are too and um, welcome you all very much. Um, and thank you, Stuart. So over to you. Thanks very much, Joe. Okay, um, Lydia, uh, I'm just gonna pass on to you now if you um, would like to, uh, you'd be able to click through the slides now, I think. Um, yeah, there's your first one there. So Lydia McLaren from Savills, over to you. Hi, I can't actually see the slides, Stuart. Okay, apologies, let me see if I can oh. fix that. Sorry, there's a slight technical difficulty. Let me just see if I can fix that. There we go, got them. Perfect, okay. thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lydia McLaren and I work in the residential research team at Savills. So today I'm gonna to give you an overview of what's going on in the housing market and then also take you through some recent research we've done in conjunction with CIH. So first up, let's have a look at what's going on in the current housing market. So we're going to take a look at this chart, which shows what's been going on with house price growth, according to Nationwide, and also shows what's been going on with sentiment, as measured by the RICS sentiment survey. So what you can see here is that it has been quite a volatile time in the market over the last few months. We've seen the most widespread ever falls in new buyer inquiries in the first part of this year, and this was triggered by lockdown and physical restrictions on the market. But what you can see is since then, we've actually seen a widespread recovery in sentiment. In terms of house price growth, we have also seen quite a lot of volatility. If you look again at the chart, you can see if you look at the blue bars, you can see the price growth is now back at where we were in 2017, 2016. So a very quick reversal of the price falls that we did see in June. In September, Nationwide reported annual house price growth of over 5%. So this is actually the highest house price growth we've seen in over four years. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the slide to work. Stuart, would you mind clicking onto the next slide, please? Thank you. So bearing all of that in mind, let's look at our latest house price growth forecast. So the pace of change in the housing market really has taken us all by surprise in the past few months. 
So we did revise our house price forecast in June to take account of COVID. But since then, the market has continued to recover. So we have revised our forecast again in September. So this table shows the most recent house price forecasts. So whilst there have been concerns about the wider economy, there have been factors which have encouraged a wave of activity in the market, such as a stamp duty holiday. And all evidence in the market is now pointing to house price growth in 2020. So this year, we are predicting UK house price growth of 4%, as market demand outpaces the supply being brought to the market. Looking at next year, the future does still look uncertain regarding a second lockdown, whether or not we'll have a vaccine. And also, you've got the stamp duty holiday ending, you've got changes to help to buy coming in, and also unemployment expected to peak. So actually, next year, we are expecting prices to soften in the first half of the year before they firm up again later on in the year. In the longer term, we are predicting five-year house price growth in the UK of 20.4%, as this is due to a longer period of low interest rates, which gives greater capacity for more price growth. And in terms of regional patterns, we are expecting the patterns we were seeing pre-COVID to continue, so the Midlands and the North to continue to be the strongest performing regions. Let's see if I can get this slide working. Stuart, would you mind flicking onto the next slide, please? So now what's going on in the development market? So obviously development has been affected by COVID, but how are things looking now? So if we start by looking at the number of completions, we can use the number of EPCs issued for new dwellings to give us a bit of a guide. You can see in the yellow bars what we had been delivering month by month, and you can see how much new build completions did actually fall off in April. But then what you can also see is how, how much new build completions have actually recovered since. So the number of new home completions is now back at 89% of pre-COVID levels, and they did fall down to 37% of pre-COVID levels in April. So delivery really has jumped back up again and shows how the market has been able to get going again. I think one interesting thing to point out is what we have seen is that new sites started has been slightly slower to recover. So what we are starting to see is a slight divergence between new homes started and new homes completed. Next slide, please, Stuart. So what does all of this mean for future delivery? So here, if you look at the chart, you can see how much we've been delivering in England over the last few years. So we are forecasting that 15 to 20% fewer homes will be built this year compared to last year. And unless we start building on more sites, even with build to rent, affordable and private sale altogether, we do still have a long way to go to reach the mid 2020s target. And if the target can't be delivered through private sale, then this means that there is the potential for build to rent, but also affordable housing to have a greater role in helping fill the supply gap. Next slide, please. So what about affordable housing delivery? So this chart here looks at affordable housing delivery over time. In the most recent year, total affordable housing delivery reached over 57,000 homes. So you can see that the delivery of affordable housing really has been growing in recent years. I think what's more interesting here is the change in the 10 years delivered. The delivery of social rent really has fallen off in recent years, whilst delivery of affordable rent and shared ownership has started to gather pace. So social rent made up 11% of delivery in 2018-19, and this is compared to shared ownership, which made up 30% of delivery. So going back to the market context, yes, you do have house price growth, but you do also have lenders being more risk averse, which has restricted the buying potential for the bottom of the market, so for your first time buyers. So there, there, there are questions whether over we'll see a shift towards new build products with lower deposit requirements, such as shared ownership, which you can now buy for as little as a 10% stake alongside first discounted first homes and also help to buy. 
And I think it's important to point out here that yes, the story is positive, And although we do appear to be in a mini housing market boom, it's not a one size fits all picture. And it is being driven by those who do have financial security. So those who are able to buy or rent in the open market. Next slide, please. So now I thought I'd move on to take you through some recent research we have done with CIH. So this is our annual housing sector survey, and we had over 175 responses from senior officials amongst both housing associations and also local authorities. So I'm now going to take you through some of the key findings from the survey. Next slide, please, Stuart. So one of the first things that we wanted to know is how has COVID-19 changed sector priorities? So you can see on the left here that we have seen an increase in the importance for the likes of tenant support, quality of service and supporting vulnerable and homeless households. And then if you move to the middle, you can see that there is a greater importance placed on investment in existing stock and also development of new homes, but of affordable tenures. So what you start to see here is this tension between development of affordable tenures, but also greater investment in existing stock. If you look over to the right, what you can see is that new homes for market sale and market rent have actually reduced as priorities this year. Next slide, please. This slide here looks at how COVID-19 has impacted sector capacity and aspirations. And you can see that COVID-19 has clearly tempered appetite for risk, but also financial capacity. But I think this slide is interesting because it also shows the shift in the sector towards providers having greater control over stock and wanting to develop more stock themselves, which is really encouraging. Next slide, please. Now, if we move on to look at existing stock, Unsurprisingly, building safety and compliance came out as top priorities for the sector, both in the short term and the long term. But you, what you can see here is that net zero carbon does become more of a priority in the long term. Next slide, please. So how will we fund this future investment? So the majority of respondents highlighted the need for grant funding to help fund investment in existing stock. And we do now have greater clarity and greater certainty with the new affordable homes programme and how the 12 billion pounds of grant funding will be split between 10 years, but also how it will be split between London and the rest of the country. What you can also see here is that the sector, as well as being reliant on grant funding, is also reliant on bank finance, capital markets finance, and also rental income. Next slide, please. This next question looks at the obstacles to net zero carbon. So unsurprisingly, availability of grant has come through very strongly. Also, you have government policy, cost certainty and technical solutions all coming up as clear constraints. So net zero carbon is really one of the biggest challenges facing the sector currently, although we do still have 30 years to reach these objectives. These 30 years is actually equivalent to 1500 weeks, which I think when you say it like that kind of does put things into perspective. The Savills estimates that 4.3 billion pounds of investment is needed per annum on top of planned maintenance work to achieve these decarbonisation objectives in existing stock. So there really are some key fundamental challenges associated with net, net zero carbon. But also I think there are quite a lot of opportunities for the sector to develop new technologies and opportunities for partnerships and for collaboration. Next slide, please. So to summarize everything from the survey, you have the sector is clearly adopting a people first development second approach. And there does seem to be a real emphasis this year on supporting tenants and supporting vulnerable and key worker households. The sector is definitely committed to meeting the challenge of building new homes, but also investing more in existing stock. And I think going forwards, government policy and government funding will be critical in helping the sector meet these challenges. That is it from me. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Lydia. That was brilliant. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, pass. Well, just in a moment, we're going to pass to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Stuart Gads Gadsden. But just uh, a quick reminder to everybody: there's a, a please do get your questions in uh, using the questions uh, box there. So um, uh, we've got plenty of things we can get stuck into, but we'll just loads from there, uh, loads there. Sorry, from Lydia's presentation. So um, yeah, please get the questions coming in. Okay, Stuart, um, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Stuart Gadsden here from Kenza Contracting. I'm going to try and move my own slides, but it doesn't seem to be working, so I think I'll need your help again, Stuart. So if you can go to the next slide, please. I'll just start with a quick uh, information there from the Committee on Climate Change. They think that we need to install at least two and a half million heat pumps by 2030 if we have uh, any chance of meeting our uh, net zero carbon commitments. And currently, the, the UK install about 20,000 heat pumps a year. So you can see that if we carry on at the current rate, we'll only get 200,000 done by 2030. So that leaves a further 2.3 million to find. So that's this, the scale of the challenge facing us, I think. How does a heat pump work? Well, uh, you've probably seen lots of these uh, types of slides before. Fairly simply, uh, a ground source heat pump consists of three closed loop cycles. We have the heat source. So that is uh, a water glycol mixture flowing through the ground. It collects about five degrees of energy. That goes into our heat pump. We transfer that energy to a refrigeration cycle. We then compress it from the heat pump itself. Uh, we get a high pressure, high temperature gas that then releases that energy to the water in our central heating circuits. And then uh, we, we are nice and hot and we get our uh, hot water. Everyone has a heat pump at home. It's our fridge. And all, all that a heat pump does is it moves heat from one place to another. And the beauty of, of a a heat pump is that it's very efficient. So for every one unit of electricity that you have to put in to power the heat pump, you would expect to get around about three units of heat out. And that's why you know heat pumps are seen as uh, the future uh, heating technology for, for domestic properties in the UK. Next slide, please, Stuart. So typically, when people think of a ground source heat pump, you, you probably imagine Kevin McLeod and grand designs and a, a large house that's uh, built to a, a very high insulating standard and there's lots of lots of ground area available and you have one house one large heat pump in it, and it works very well and that's that's a great model and, and Kenzo's sold many heat pumps to this market but what we need to do is, is move towards widespread deployment uh, and that's hopefully uh, what we are trying to do here at Kenzo with our, with our partners next slide please Stuart so with our widespread deployment we have to we have to look at doing it at scale uh, and this is uh, district heating, but perhaps district heating as you've, you've never seen it before. We call it a shared ground loop, but you might have heard it referred to as an ambient loop or even a fifth generation district heating network. Uh, and in our approach, each individual property still has its own heat pump, still fully under the control of, of that homeowner. They can switch it on and off when they want. They can buy their electricity from whichever provider they want, but they are connected to uh, a shared network of underground pipes. Uh, so we have lots of boreholes in the ground. Uh, they are drilled vertically to depths, maybe up to, to 200 meters. Uh, we connect them all together, and then you're just left with a, a flow and return pipe that then just tees off and goes into each individual property. Each individual property pumps the, the energy around the, the system and just takes out what it needs from the, the home. So in a way, it's just mimicking the traditional gas framework. Our mains gas network is, is pipes down the middle of the road. It tees off to everyone's house. You have a little gas meter box and your own individual gas boiler. All we're doing is replacing that gas infrastructure with, with borehole infrastructure, but then you still have your own heat pump. So the first project uh, that we did with Stormwater Housing Association, it was back in uh, 2017, and they carried out a project in Webley in Herefordshire. And this was for 49 bungalows that is predominantly a sheltered housing scheme, so mainly with their elderly residents uh, over 65 and above. And all these properties had had the, the cavity walls filled, the loft insulation, there was new double glazing, so Stonewater felt they'd done all they could to, to reduce the energy consumption, but they were still heated with electric night storage heaters, which was obviously causing uh, problems for the residents in terms of affordability. Uh, and also not a great solution in, in terms of carbon. So Stonewater, after considering lots of different uh, possible solutions, 
decided to, to replace it with uh, our district ground source heat pump solution. And I think an important point to note is that all of this work was carried out while residents remain in their homes. So there is disruption, but you can still do a ground source heat pump project with everyone remaining in their properties. Next slide, Stuart, thanks. And the key objective, I think, uh, fundamentally was the overall uh, well-being of the residents of Stonewater. You know, it was vitally important to Stonewater to, to come up with a solution that would reduce the running costs for their, their residents, many of whom were, were living in fuel poverty. Uh, and when you make it more affordable for people to heat their homes, then they can actually afford to heat the whole home and not maybe just one or two rooms. Uh, and also, you know, there's a lot of uh, research been done to show that there's a lot of excess winter deaths in the UK with people just not being able to properly heat their homes. Stonewater also like the idea of minimising their lifetime cost of ownership because if they've got warm, heated homes, uh, less mold growth, less damp, uh, plus a system that was that was easy to maintain uh, in the long term. And then I think at the bottom really was oh. And by the way, it will reduce your carbon emissions and, and really make a difference to, to that net zero carbon drive that we're all aiming for. Next slide, please, Stuart. So in terms of the project itself, uh, when you do a ground source heat pump, you can't get away from doing some external work and that's uh, drilling boreholes. These are vertical boreholes going down at, at this project up to 164 metres deep. Uh, the borehole itself is, is, is very small. It's only 150 mil diameter, but you get a pair of pipes down there and you fill that with the, the heat transfer fluid and we just pump pump that around to, to gain about five degrees of heat. From the top of each borehole, we just have pipe work that then runs back from that borehole uh, to each individual property where we then connect to the heat pump. Uh, there's no heat losses from that distribution pipe work because we're only circulating the, the fluid at around zero to 10 degrees. So it's district heating, but at a much, much lower temperature than what you would expect, expect from a centralized plant system. Next slide, please, Stuart. And then the internal work at uh, Stonewater Properties, the first thing we do is we fit the heat pump in the cylinder. And by getting that done on the first day of the installation, it means that we can turn the, the, the system on and uh, the, the residents straight away have hot water. So no one is ever left without hot water at all. You know, they get the hot water on the first day. And then we come back, we remove all the storage heaters and install the, the new wet central heating system, which is just a radiator based system. And then that's all carried out uh, within, a, within a single day. And then obviously a little bit of, of snagging and tidying up. And you'd expect the whole system to be completed within the properties within no more than about a week. And as I said, all these elderly residents remained in situ. And we even carried out this project uh, in the, the coldest winter months of November and December. So, uh, you know, it didn't it didn't cause anyone too many too many problems because they were never really without heating for more for more than the day itself. Next slide, please, Stuart. So obviously the residents' well-being was at the heart of this project, uh, and we were replacing electric night storage heaters, which is still the, the low-hanging fruit in terms of reducing running costs. And just if you look here, the, the utility fuel cost. We all know that mains gas is still by far the cheapest uh, form of fuel. Uh, latest uh, figures from Bayes Research is, you know, gas is around 4p a kilowatt hour and, and electric's over 16.5p uh, a kilowatt hour. But the efficiency that you get of a ground source heat pump compared to the night storage heaters and the mains gas boilers means that the delivered heat cost per kilowatt hour uh, for a ground source heat pump starts to get close to that of a mains gas boiler. And then if you factor in that if if you're on mains gas, you could take away the annual standing charge, then the ground source heat pumps actually uh, becomes the, the lowest cost solution. But against the night storage heaters that Stonewater residents have, if they were heating their properties fully, and not many of them were, but if they were heating them fully, you'd expect that a ground source heat pump would potentially uh, reduce the running cost by uh, around about half. Next slide, please, Stuart. And then if you look at the, the carbon emissions, uh, I've, I've used the carbon intensities that will be in the new SAP uh, 10.1 that will be released when the new building regulations are released, which hopefully should be sometime next spring. Uh, and you can see that the carbon intensity of, of grid electricity has really reduced due to the decarbonisation of the grid. And quite clearly they are, the ground source heat pump is emitting about a third of uh, the carbon compared to electric night storage heaters. And then if you compare it against the mains gas boiler, it's about one fifth. So, you know, ground source heat pumps really can make a big impact on carbon reduction. Next next slide then. And the good thing was Stonewater were delighted with that first project and they've, they've gone on to do more. So we've already done uh, over a 
120 heat pumps with Stonewater Housing Association, and we're now live on another project, a part of the Energy Super Hub Oxford, which is a government-funded project receiving about £30 million of Innovate UK funding, and it's looking at widespread electric vehicle charging. It's got some large hybrid battery storage, but ground source heat pumps are, are, are in there, and uh, there's a lot of optimization controls, which is the innovative part. Next slide, please, Stuart. So the project uh, in, in Oxford is on the Blackbird Lease Estate, uh, not far from the city centre. And what's interesting about this project is 56 of the properties have electric storage heaters, but we are now replacing four that have gas combi boilers. And that's an increasing trend that we're seeing some of our clients are now actually taking out the gas boilers. It's exactly the shared ground loop system as before. Resident well-being is the priority, although we do have the, the issue of COVID-19 that's making things a little bit harder on site, but the, the project is still moving forward. Next slide, please, Chuck. And the key innovation uh, on this project is that we are using a uh, time of use energy tariffs from Octopus Agile uh, linked with the sm smart switchy thermostat. And effectively what we're able to do then is we're going to load shift the times that the ground source heat pump will operate. And you can see there that for most of the day in the Agile Octopus tariff, it's around about 10 for your unit. And there's only the, the peak between about three o'clock in the afternoon to seven o'clock where it's really expensive. So if we can heat our properties predominantly in that really cheap electricity period, which tends to coincide with low carbon, then we can really, really uh, reduce the running costs even further with a ground source heat pump. And all of this project is going to be monitored by Oxford University and Oxford Brooks University, so that we should have really good research at the end of it, backed up by world leading institutions to show, to show the impact. Next slide, please, Stuart. And there we got the final words. Oh, yeah, the, the running costs there, just to show, if we use the ground source heat pump with the time of use tariff, the running costs now start to be significantly lower than the electric storage as we're replacing, but actually potentially even a third lower than the mains gas boiler. And there's 1.6 million gas boilers installed a year. It's those that we need to target if we're really going to target the, the carbon emissions. And then just the final slide, Stuart. But I don't think anyone needs to take my word for it. It's, it's, this project was all about the residents. This is some of their feedback. You know, some of them have said it's life changing. You know, they're now lovely and warm in every room. It is a lot cheaper for them. They're now in control. And perhaps, you know, there's no better compliment than to say it's just like gas central heating because gas central heating has been the most popular uh, form of heating system in the UK. And we need to find an alternative. And we think ground source heat pumps have it. It is a fantastic project. And there's a, a little video when you all get the slides that you can actually hear the residents in their own words uh, with their feedback. So hopefully that's given you a, a little flavour of ground source heat pumps in action and how we can really tackle the retrofit challenge. That's great, Stuart. Thank you so much for that. Um, OK, tons of stuff there. I've got several questions uh, about that. But um, we're going to pass on to, to Jo Hills now uh, from Raven to talk us through uh, her slides. So, Jo, over to you. I'll, I'll click through the slides for you, Jo. It might be easier. So I'll just pass, you, uh, pass on to you now. Great, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so I'm just going to talk us through um, what we've been doing at Raven specifically um, on retrofit. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, our current position, where we are today, um, the challenge that we saw in front of us um, once we started analysing it, how we've approached it, um, how we... <laughs> think we're going to pay for it. Um, uh, some ideas of a pilot project and the issues that we um, are thinking that we're going to face in the years ahead. Next slide, please, Stuart. So the first thing we had to do was to look at where we are today. Um, so we got our footprint done. Um, the first thing we did actually was to look at the carbon footprint overall um, across the whole of our estate. We started with that. So that included our operational costs, um, carbon costs, and our, um, our new build and existing homes, fleet, um, staff travel, and so on. Um, 
And we found, which won't be a surprise to many of you, I suppose, that it was existing homes that were the by far um, the largest con contributor. Um, it, I think it was a surprise to some people because as soon as we started talking about it, a lot of people started um, think, focusing on what could we get the staff to do, what should we be doing in terms of transport and so on. Um, but actually, if we're going to make a really big difference, um, then we need to be focusing on the existing homes. And of course, as was talked about, um, by Ali um, on Tuesday, we're focusing as well on making sure that our new build homes don't contribute to um, being the retrofit nightmare of the future. Um, but that was the focus of Tuesday. So today I'm just going to talk about the existing homes. If you look at the um, graphs in front of you, I uh, don't expect you to see the detail, but it just gives you an indication. The top one is the um, carbon emissions of our stock um, and the bottom one is our um, our SAP ratings, um, EPC grades. So if you if you look at the bottom one, you'll see that anything in green um, is C and above. So the vast majority of our stock is EPC C and above. Our average SAP is 64. Um, and for those of you who are who are up on these things, obviously SAP 69 is what you need to get to be EPC C, which is the target for um, where the government wants us all to be by 2030. So I think Raven was quite privileged in that we were in quite a good position um, when we started out. Next slide, please. So the challenge. Um, in business plan terms. So our existing planned and cyclical programmes were already um, a 30-year spend of, um, as you can see, 470 million. So this is um, this is all the investment works that, that everybody does, kitchens and bathroom investment, roof replacements, um, etc. Um, and we've added on to that an analysis of the carbon spend on top of that. Um, and the challenge is that the whole cost goes up by 25%. Um, so obviously this was a bit of a blow um, to discover that, uh, which is what you are, I'm sure, all facing um, across the across the sector. Um, and the 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 way we've analysed that is by getting an analysis of all of each of our homes individually, all 6,000 of them. Um, and getting them uh, analysed for what their current SAP is now and, and carbon emissions, where we need them to be and what the measures are that need to happen in each of those individual homes to get there um, and what that will cost. So we've got a, a contributing cost for each of our homes um, that, that adds up to that um, 115. Now, I wouldn't say that the 115 is a completely definite and fixed cost. It's based on lots of assumptions um, and every now and then we cut our cloth in different ways, making different assumptions, for instance, about what grant is likely to come forward um, and we um, come to slightly different figures. So you'll hear a lot of figures bandied about in the sector um, about what carbon cost could be per unit. Um, and I think the frank answer is that nobody really knows until we have more certainty on what the grant will be and how quickly the supply chain and the technology can move, um, we're really going to be um, working on an estimate. But we've got a pretty good estimate and it was good enough for us to begin our business plan modelling. Um, so that's the challenge that we've taken up. Can I have a next slide, please, Stuart? So this graph shows you the way that our stock broke down. So once um, once we'd got the um, analysis of each of the different homes, we're then able to look at how do they cluster by type? What, what kinds of clusters of measures are we likely to do? Um, so we've got quite a few homes that are reasonably modern, um, new build-ish, um, which are on the left-hand side of the chart. Um, it's fairly fairly easy to um, to deal with and then we've got the huge chunk in the middle um, which are, are a mixture and then we've got some on the right hand side which are very high cost 16% um, of them so um, it's a different approach to each of the different type, different categories um, 
could we go the other way, Stuart? One more. Thank you. That's fine. So, so what is the different approach for those different categories? Um, so for the high cost ones, that's 16 percent on the right hand side of the chart. Um, we're really looking at needing to do a whole house retrofit. Um, you're good, we're really it's not going to be enough just to um, tidy them up a little bit. Um, so we've been talking to people like um, Energy Sprong about how how would be best to to do that. Um, obviously, there are challenges due to the type and age and location of some of these properties. Um, but if we go down the Energy Sprong route, then um, a lot of you are probably familiar with that. But the idea is that they come along and they do the whole house all in one go. Um, a lot of it is based on um, off-site manufacture, so particularly the um, the external wall insulation, the roofing panels um, might be all manufactured off-site, um, and you're aiming to be producing your energy on-site. Um, so such products as um, Stuart from Kenza has just spoken about. Um, for the medium cost ones, it's going to be more of a mixture of methods. Um, so fabric first, of course, um, because we're going to want to get everything insulated as much as possible, get the insulation and ventilation right. Um, ventilation is a bit of a bugbear of mine. Um, I, uh, I think that the sector made a big mistake um, when we approached this last time in that we all did lots and lots of wonderful insulation, which is great, um, but we didn't do anything on ventilation. Um, and for that, we are paying the penance in terms of mould and condensation in, in the homes that we manage. Um, and our residents obviously are struggling with that. Um, and it's leading to lots of challenges on the disrepair and the and the homes for human, human habitation front as well, um, which we we really really need to make sure that we address um, before we go ahead this time. So there's a tech, there's a technical challenge there um, that we're hopefully all aware of this time um, and won't make the same mistakes again. So anyway, having improved the fabric first and the insulation and ventilation, um, then we'll add the heating source later. So it's possible that some of those would be in a two phased approach. Um, and for the low cost ones, this is where we're talking about relatively new build properties um, that just need a little bit of improvement. We're assuming that they were built to modern building standards, which would mean that they're already relatively well insulated. So it's just a focus on that heating and ventilation uh, and sort of just minor fabric upgrades where appropriate, um, where they're not quite meeting the standards. At the end of all of that, having retrofitted all of our properties, we still get 15% residual carbon. So we're talking about net zero carbon, but we don't actually achieve it from that retrofit alone because there's an assumption that the grid will be gradually decarbonized as we go and it will pick up that final 15%. If we fail in that, and we might, then um, we will be, we have a plan for offsetting, um, but also it may well be that um, technology might have caught up and there'll be other technologies by that point. We are talking about 30 years hence, um, so a lot will have changed. Next slide, please. Uh, so, how will we pay for it? Um, bringing forward future spend. So, instead of, um, we've currently got our business plan with um, 30 years worth of investment spend. Um, roofs and windows and doors and so on. So instead of spreading that across 30 years, we'll be saying, OK, what we're doing is we're replacing those now with um, the correct measures for um, carbon reduction, but it's still replacing roofs and windows and doors. So it is a, in effect, it's bringing forward future spend. So we're able to discount that planned um, investment from the cost of um, the carbon investment. Um, renewable heat incentives, um, I think Stuart could talk more about that later, um, but that is um, that is obviously uh, a challenge because it, the, the renewable heat incentive is coming to an end and we don't know whether that will be replaced. There will be um, various grants and, and other means of funding coming forward and um, as most of you will be aware, some of those have been starting to come out already. Um, so we're all looking into those. There'll be savings on um, voids and arrears. Um, we 
we'll assume, um, which we'll drive hard to try to make sure that we can. Um, but certainly, if customers are making great savings on their um, on their energy bills, then we would hope that they'll be able to um, afford their rent more easily. Um, the whole affordability challenge should be eased, um, so there should be a positive benefit from that. Um, we are intending to collaborate as much as we can, working in partnership with um, other housing associations and local authorities um, to drive down the costs by enabling our suppliers to be able to um, get bulk orders and um, get economies of scale. Um, and we'll be taking up whatever innovation comes our way. Um, and there's some great things coming forward from companies like Kenza um, that we're hearing about all the time. Um, and uh, and I'm sure that will come on even more in the future. Um, we're also going to have to um, both demolish and uh, and regenerate, um, but also consider disposal. So this is a way for us to continue to um, build new homes at the same time. Um, Compromise and collaborate. I've just spoken about collaboration. Um, resident contribution, we're not keen on that particularly. Um, it's something that is being considered whereby um, residents pay a small sum out of the savings that they make. Um, but uh, really, we're hoping that the residents can get a lot of benefit from this work. Next slide, please, Stuart. So here's an example project um, which we're hoping to go with next year. Um, so we've got um, 27 1960s homes um, and uh, they're currently, um, they're not actually not too bad on the SAP, but um, obviously need to be improved. Um, but, uh, but they're an opportunity because they're quite sort of regular builds, straightforward, um, and they can be uh, potentially really good um, pilot for energy sprung or similar sort of whole house approach. So we've looked at how we can afford that, looking at the estimated works, deducting the planned works, new renewable heat incentive, hoping that we get it in in time, or similar grant funding. Um, and we come to a net cost of um, 16,600. Um, and that is, that, that's just an example. Um, we haven't yet sort of decided for sure where we'll go and, and which project we'll go forward with, um, but we're just working that up with partners right now. Um, it should be confirmed shortly. Next slide, please. So the issues um, have been touched on actually by previous speakers. Finance, obviously, I've talked about. Data, data is a, a really important part of this. Knowing what our current position is and what it's going to be in the future. Um, I noticed that um, Stuart from Kenza just spoke about um, use of Switchy um, and th that is a, an example of the sort of tracking that we need to do to help our customers to manage their homes um, and being able to get that kind of data of what is the humidity of your home, what is the temperature of your home, um, you know, should you now be opening a window, um, that kind of information is really helpful and we want to be working that into our, uh, we're just literally about to start a pilot right now um, to test some of, uh, some of that kind of sensor technology to enable customers to take charge of what happens in their homes. Leaseholders um, are a challenge. Um, we need to persuade them of the benefits. And the same with all residents, getting them ready for this, getting them to understand what the benefits will be for them um, is a great challenge. Um, and we're going to be working with um, place shapers um, on a project to look at how to engage with residents best and, and how to make sure that they're on board, that they, that they understand both how to use the technology to get the best out of it and also what the benefits for them could be. Um, technology, as we've said, it's, gonna, it's going to zoom ahead, I'm sure. There's going to be lots of innovation. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes forward. Um, right now, there's some really great products available that we need to take advantage of. But the supply chain really needs support um, in development. And, and the best way we can do that is to work in partnership, to collaborate, so that we can provide the security of, um, of forward orders and also the, um, the large scale that I've talked about before. Um, and skills. There is um, lovely Andy, our, one of our plumbers, um, who is looking forward to being retrained and learning how to um, 
how to work with ground source heat pumps and, and all sorts of other new technology. Um, and, uh, and we will do a lot on skills and, and look forward to being able to run and maintain our own, uh, our own technology. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, thank you to all our panellists today for some excellent um, presentations. Okay, right. So we've got now just over 10 minutes for uh, questions and um, discussion. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to move on from this so we can see everybody. Here we go. If I can ask the panellists just to um, put your uh, webcams on again, please, so we can all, all see each other. What I'm going to do um, is ju I'm just going to quickly share the results of the poll we did earlier, again, just to remind us of, um, of that. So here we go. Um, so what that shows, obviously, is that when we had about two thirds of people complete that, which is great. So thank you so much. Um, and pretty much clear here that um, a, a, a majority of the, the attendees today, anyway, are still very much at the uh, the start of understanding, um, you know, their their carbon footprint. So pretty much at the start of the carbon uh, journey. So hopefully today's been really useful for you in terms of understanding. Um, you know what the, the state of play is in the market, and obviously what um, you know what products are available, and clearly what uh, decisions that, that Raven has come to based on the evidence of, of its own properties. So um, those are results there. I'm out of interest actually to um, uh, to, to Joe. Does that surprise you at all? Seeing that as a result. Um. I think not from what I've been hearing about. Um, and actually, to be fair to people, it really was. Um, only a very little over a year ago that the government first made the announcement that they were going to have this expectation um, and um, and we haven't yet even had sort of clear clear um, expectations set by the regulator uh, for social housing so I, I I think that that it's not unreasonable to expect that that is where people are right now to be honest um, we just happen to be very keen on this and to have expertise um, in our team um, so we were able to get a flying start I think yeah I mean Lydia we obviously heard in your uh, presentation um, about um, clearly some of the survey work that Savills has done to understand where the sector is at just now. Um, I mean, it, it, it presumably it is the case, although obviously the number one priority for housing providers in the sector just now is around building safety and compliance issues. Uh, presumably, I think I heard you correctly, it is the case that uh, focusing on the, the zero carbon challenge is still very much a key priority for, uh, for housing providers. Yeah, I mean, definitely. So I think in the short term, it does seem as though providers are concerned with building safety and compliance, but you do really see it coming in in the long term as a priority. And I think, you know, it, it's 30 years away, but when you kind of put it into weeks, like it's 1500 weeks, you know, that will go quickly. You know, it, it needs to be, you know, we, we need to consider it and it, needs, it is a key priority. And I think it's just, yeah, kind of continuing that momentum. Yeah. OK. All right. So um, just uh, there's a when you mentioned skills at the at the end there, there was a question from uh, one of the audience members just um, uh, around that point. And obviously, clearly, we'll be, we'll bring you on this, Stuart, in a minute, too, if that's OK. But um, very much that that point about the extent to which the, the industry, um, you know, the skills are there to, um, to, to, to do the retrofitting work that, that we need. I mean, we talked on Tuesday's session about this from the point perspective of, of new build and obviously thinking about modern methods of construction, but clearly on existing homes and um, the potential for, for that is maybe slightly, slightly less, um, although still still there to some extent. But I just wondered, um, you know, are you confident that you see enough of a focus here to um, to see that that, that, that may be improving that skills and, uh, and supply chain situation? Joe, to you first, then to you, Stuart. Um, it's an area that I think we need a lot of work on, to be honest. Um, we, we've been doing a, an external wall insulation project um, in recent times, and I think it's been pretty clear. There have been a lot of learnings from that where actually the people working on it perhaps um, did not yet have that sort of understanding yet of what do the residents need and what what you know how to how to involve the residents in what's needed and and how to um, bring them along on the journey with them and also and also what residents would expect to be happening around them um, and then we've got the issues of see making sure that everything is properly properly um, airtight and sealed um, at, at the end and I think I think there are challenges there with understanding and with skills, which 
every project that we do we're going to learn and we're going to improve and 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 certainly we will do lessons learned from every project as we go um, and we'll we'll increase our knowledge we've got um, a direct labor um, uh, repairs team and uh, as I say, like lovely Andy there, um, they're very keen to be able to learn and do it themselves. So certainly the long term maintenance um, we'll be taking on ourselves. Um, but yeah, that that installation skill set, I think, is something that the whole sector needs to take on very seriously. OK, thanks, Joe. Stuart, what's your take on this? Yep. Yeah, uh... I think obviously when you're installing a ground source heat pump, there are some specialist works, you know, namely drilling the boreholes. Uh, but that that sector uh, will grow with us if if there's demand there. I think when it comes to installing the systems inside people's properties, the approach that Kenza is actually taking is to try and partner with the the housing association or the council, and actually work with either their direct in-house service teams or work with their already appointed framework contractors. So we actually train them up so that they know how to install the systems. And then obviously, crucially, they then know how to maintain them long term. So if we take Raven as an example, we are already in discussion uh, with Joe's colleagues and the, the direct in-house team about how Raven could, could come on board uh, and not only just install the systems for Ravens, but actually they could potentially offer services to other housing associations within the southeast of England uh, on both the installation side of it and the long term maintenance. Uh, so I think it's the way we look at it is Kenza are the experts in heat pumps. We know how these things work. We we need we need the bodies and we can train them up and use them. So I, I, I think I think we can do it, but we, we, we need to, we do need to work in partnership with each other to, to, to overcome that. Great, thank you. Okay, a couple more questions are now. One from Kevin Walters for, for you, Joe. Um, just uh, uh, asking for a bit more about the data used to estimate the, the costs, the retrofit costs. Um, he's asking if there was a specific data framework that you used to uh, categorise each property. Um, yeah, so um, that was um, that was done using Chrome, which is I, I think it's pretty much the industry standard, um, to be honest now. Um, that's Chrome, um, the, the software um, that, that does. It takes the um, data from the um, EPCs, um, SAP rating and so on, um, and also looks at the um, build type um, and comes up with a package of different measures. Um, so yeah, so and I think you'll find that that is the way that most people are approaching it because it's got this great data set behind it and and it's continually updated um, so that you can know that it's the um, it's the cutting edge. So pretty much any consultant that you go to, I think, would be would be using Chrome um, in the background to help manipulate the data. Uh, a question, I think, to maybe to all three of you to have a think about um, for another audience member, just wondering about um, just in, in general, any particular uh, things that you know, you'd like to see um, people thinking about to ensure that the housing sector can maybe make the most of its collective efforts to ensure we have the best possible chance of um, you know delivering on the, uh, the 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 changes that are needed to to hit this the 2050 target. Um, I don't know, um, you know, George, you want to pick up on that first? Um, hmm. <laughs> I was expecting you to go to Lydia then. <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I think the sector as a whole, the, the big ask really is um, of government. And we, we really need to have um, policy clarity. Um, it would be really useful to know, for instance, um, are they going to stick with EPCC by 2030? How, how strong are they going to push that? Um, and um, are there going to be any other intermediate, intermediate targets on the way as well? Um, because what we don't want is to spend an awful lot of time making plans and then find it shifted in a different direction. Um, we also need um, clarity on funding. Um, as we've mentioned, that we're, we're making plans here for 30 year investment um, and we're modeling our whole business plan on it. So to have um, funds come out like the one that came out last week, um, very short term, you've got to turn it around in a month um, and you've got to spend it within a year. Um, it, it, it's really difficult to be sort of planning and fits and starts like that. We, we've, we need sort of secure, stable funding that we can work with. Um, and, and I'm sure government is addressing that. I, I know that they are getting onto it. Um, so I have every confidence that, that that may be coming forward, but the sooner it comes forward, the easier it will be for us. Lydia, what's your sense of that? I mean, do you, are you hearing about any kind of um, 
moves in the funding front at all from uh, from from the work that you do at Savills? Um, I mean, I would definitely echo what Joe has said in terms of needing kind of longer term funding, and I think that does seem to be something that the government is considering. Kind of the benefits of, for example, a ten-year funding program. You know, allowing providers to plan over the longer term, you know, rather than the standard five years. So I think that is definitely something that's being considered. And I think as well, kind of large scale pilots would be really helpful to kind of understand how the funding works and also to have kind of help develop the technologies. And it's a really good opportunity for collaboration as well. OK, thank you. Stuart, sorry, and, and your, your take on this? Uh, I, I Without echoing what everyone else has said, I think funding is, is, is top of the tree there. I think the other thing I would I'd probably say is, uh, in a lot of my conversations with uh, with all housing associations, certainly a ground source heat pump installation is, is, is seen as a as a trial of the technology. And I, I guess my, my counter argument is it, the technology is tried and tested. It may be a trial within your own organisation of how, of how it might work within your organization and the processes and the things that you need to learn within your organization but i think it's, it's, it's maybe a wider realization that a, a lot of the technology that that we can use to reach net zero carbon some of it does exist today it can be installed at widespread at scale today so it's it's not a trial of the technology it's it's just embedding it within your organization so i think it's taking what other organizations have learned and, and realizing that okay it does work we just need to work out how to use it in our organization Okay, that's great. Well, thank thank you so much, um, Stuart, and thank you all the panel for for your uh, your time and your your insights today. We're going to be all out of time, um, but we've heard um, you know hopefully um, a really clear idea of the uh, the scale of the challenges today. But um, hopefully also that there's lots of solutions out there, and that um, although some of the figures might be be large and slightly scary when you when you when you add them up, however you, know, you break it down to smaller uh, smaller packages, then you know there's still absolutely um, lots of opportunity and possibilities. Uh, it seems to me in terms of the retrofit agenda so um really really thank you all very much for attending the event today hope you got lots from it um as i say the recording is going to be available on raven's website shortly as well as the slides um, and you'll also receive emails with links to those as well to share with your colleagues so uh, thanks again to the panel for your time today and um yeah please do join us uh, for the the third uh, episode of the um journey to net zero that raven's doing uh, next thursday uh, we'll be looking at um the opportunity that housing providers have to really lead the way on on the uh, the agenda here. So, thanks again, everybody, and um, yeah, see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye.